Unlike recruits to al-Qaeda, aspiring ISIS militants often knew little about Islam. It was open bar. Anyone who wanted to join the Islamic State could do so. It was well known that al-Qaeda had created filters. You had to show you were trustworthy, there were a series of tests and an apprenticeship. It was not all that easy. In this case, anyone can join. Even crazy people, very violent people, petty criminals. Well, that's a clip from the new frontline documentary, Terror in Europe. The film analyzing a series of terror attacks across the continent and coming to the conclusion that Europe is still not prepared to deal with the threat. Let's bring in Sebastian Rotella, a frontline correspondent, senior reporter at ProPublica. And Sebastian, this is an extremely compelling hour that you put together about a problem that we've talked so much about over the last several years. I just like to take things sort of step by step. Let's start first with Belgium. How did Belgium become such an epicenter for terror? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. As far as Belgium, you know, there has been the presence of Islamic extremist networks there going back to the 90s. And it's a small country which has strong privacy laws and well-intentioned, you know, uh, guarantees of individual rights. But the security forces were always underfunded and limited in what they could do. And as this threat grew all through the 90s and the 2000s, you had networks in Belgium involved in al-Qaeda cases and, and other activity in other countries. But there weren't attacks in Belgium. So there was just kind of this you know, this governmental dysfunction as far as uh, building up the security forces. And when the ISIS threat exploded, the Syria Jihad exploded in 2012, uh, Belgium was the country that sent the most jihadis proportionally to Syria. And the government has had in the past couple of years to really to try and beef up its forces and catch up. But it's just been behind the curve. And that's why the Paris attacks were really staged and, and, and largely dr driven by people from Belgium. We're seeing some of the footage from the, those terror attacks in Paris. So then connect the dots for us. Why, out of all the countries in Europe, did the terrorists that hatched their plan plans in Belgium decide to target Paris? Well, it was partly because, you know, some of the, the key people were from there. And, and with the way it works with ISIS, they leave their foreign fighters a lot of autonomy. So people tend to attack the country they know best. But obviously, the idea is you take advantage of the fact that Europe has open borders for just about everything, travel and commerce and tourism. But the borders still impede police and intelligence services. So they set up in Belgium where they feel that they can operate better and the security forces are weaker to attack in the major capital, the major target that is Paris, with French accomplices who were from France and knew the territory well. I just want to point out to our viewers, they're seeing footage from the Charlie Hebdo attacks. Those attacks are traced back to terrorists that had affiliations with al-Qaeda. Then we have the other Paris attacks, and those terrorists have more affiliations with ISIS. And this is something that you address in the piece. I want to just play a little bit of sound regarding the Charlie Hebdo attacks. And the person, one of the, one of the people at the center of the attack, the, the Kawachi brothers, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about how they were known entities, Sebastian, but let's just go ahead and play a little sound. In 2008, Kawachi was convicted of recruiting fighters to go to Iraq and attempting to join al-Qaeda. His sentence was three years, with 18 months suspended. <laughs> Having already spent 20 months in prison awaiting his trial, Kouachi left court a free man. From the moment they stepped out of prison, they left with an even greater hatred towards France than before. We only increased their wish for revenge and their determination to hurt us. Why did that happen, Sebastian? Why, why weren't they prosecuted for more? Why weren't they held in prison more? And then why weren't they monitored more? You know, it's a sad paradox because France is some of the best, toughest, uh, knowledgeable security forces there are on Islamic terrorism and they're good at identifying these people and, and locking them up as happened in this case but the, you know the three main players in the Charlie Hebdo attacks were all people as you say who had been convicted of crimes uh, for fighting in Iraq with al-Qaeda, for, for, for a plot, for recruiting for al-Qaeda, that in the United States they would have gotten 15 years minimum. What happens in France is that the courts are overcrowded, so if you're charged with terrorist conspiracies, a crime where you didn't actually, you know, somebody wasn't killed, the maximum sentence is 10 years, and people end up serving less than that. No one in this group, there was a bigger group of the people who ended up doing Charlie Hebdo, got more than seven years. So it's very frustrating for the police and intelligence officers because 
they find that in this attack they're dealing with people who were known but who got back out and because there was such a, after the Syrian jihad really picked up steam there were so many people to watch going off to Syria these Al Qaeda guys who they were monitoring weren't didn't seem as active and at some point they decide they have to shift resources to what seems to be the more urgent threat which is ISIS and sure enough these guys attacked Charlie Hebdo. That was one of the most remarkable parts of your piece. You see the decision that law enforcement had to make. We know these guys are Al Qaeda but we have to watch the guys that are the ISIS ones now and they had to make a choice. And the, the, the individual that we saw interviewed, the, the chief uh, anti-terror magistrate in France said that the fatal flaw is weak border control and that they were overwhelmed. They still don't have the means to watch their borders. And this is particularly important to us because of the visa waiver program we have with the EU and easy travel between our countries. So what is being done, Sebastian, to watch who's coming in and out and who can be dangerous? Well, the way Europe works is because it has open internal borders, the external international borders uh, become key to the security of all of Europe. Um, the problem is that, you know, these are individual countries all working together, and so the, the border capabilities vary widely. They're very strong and tough in some places like the U.K., comparable to the U.S., but much weaker in a place like Greece, which, as you know, is a, the place where a lot of the people who went to Syria and came back to do these attacks uh, went through. Uh, some of them who were wanted, you know, actually had arrest warrants on them or were on watch lists. So the problem is a lack of coordination, a lack of the European Union sitting down and saying we need to have uniform, tough border policy policies with databases and screening and they are starting to do that the European Union for example the the parliament after seven years of rejecting security chiefs who were pushing for uh, airline screening like we do in the US where the authorities have several days advance to, to screen passengers and look for connections that was just approved it will go to an effect in a couple of years but it, it's still very difficult because these individual countries have to work together as a 28 member European Union to f fix things like borders and that just takes time and it's a bureaucracy and it was really you, th this problem became very clear when they were overwhelmed by the sheer number right. of people uh, coming from ISIS and well, from Syria. And in just hearing you talk about the timeline that it'll be ready in a couple years you know and what happens between now and then. Sebastian I, I'm gonna have to run but just really quick what, what do you think is the single biggest lesson you learned from your reporting? I think, you know, that these, it's amazing how structural problems, people can be aware about them and talking about them and proposing laws to change them, but it takes tragic terror attacks to really push action. Not unlike happened with us in 9 11, after 9-11, I think that's the, the experience that Europe is going through now, having known what the problems were, but not, unfortunately, starting to solve them until after the tragedy. And of course, that's the, the age-old question, how to be more proactive rather than reactive. So we that's encourage right. our viewers to check out this, this documentary. Like I said, it's compelling and definitely worth a watch. Uh, that's the Frontline documentary. Sebastian, thank you very much. Great to have you on the program. Thanks very much, Jenna. It was a pleasure.